Kun is tea. How are you? Welcome to the Candlelit Tales podcast. I am sitting down here How with again, my brother. Andres. And I'm talking over my sister because we're still on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting way. But hey, that's Zoom for you. And you know what? We're, we're, we were due to release a story podcast this week. And we have decided to postpone that for multiple reasons. Um, I'm still laid up after another knee operation, so I can't be in the same uh, situation or area as Surika. And also, not one but two laptops in the Candle Tales core unit went kaput. And so we're a little bit worried and flat out and not able to produce a podcast because we don't have a production company. We don't have uh, the support of other uh, techs and help from you know broadcasting help and all the rest of it so we have basically Oshin and a sub in Roo and both of those two laptops which help produce the Candle Tales podcast were bought by money as were our mics headphones and my current little iPad which is very fun to play with at the moment because I just replaced a, a laptop with an iPad so I could do this call and uh, it has a tracker on it for the camera so if you're on YouTube look at me go look at me go oh, I mean oh. this is exactly what you should use Patreon money for just, just wiggling in front of a camera <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important for us to actually shout out, though, and and tell people how appreciative we are of the support that we get through Patreon, because without it, we wouldn't be able to produce this podcast. We wouldn't be able to pay in tech to the guys that have helped yes. us produce this podcast. And that's the way we've always done it. We were able to pay Gareth Curtis as well for uh, for in in a, an iPad and a pen for the iPad, so he'd be able to continue his art for the the series of canned little tales that he produced for us. And I guess that's our mode of paying people has been. That um, has been because we haven't ever actually hit a threshold where we're able to pay people for producing the podcasts. We are now probably at a level on Patreon where we might be able to pay one person like a little bit of money for a month. But between the three or four of us that are that are constantly working on the podcast, it would kind of almost instantly evaporate. So we decided instead we we pay in equipment, uh, we pay, you know, phone bills, we pay Internet bills. We kind of like try and defray some costs, but we don't actually reimburse ourselves. So nobody's actually paid for this. Uh, so we will have a story for you next week. Uh, the Battle Rage series is going to kick off with the story that Rue was initially only going to record the story for, but is now recording this, had, has recorded the story for and the music for and is producing because he's the only one with the laptop now uh, who knows how to do that. So uh, thank, thanks to Rue for that. And that will be out next week. Um, and for now, we said we would do a thank you to our Patreon patrons. So. Patreon tiers in our way of doing it are flat. Some creators have different tiers for different rewards. We've got some stuff up there that you can only access if you're a Patreon patron. But whether you're giving us two quid a month or 100 quid a month, um, you get the same stuff. Uh, do you want to talk about the tiers a little bit, Aaron, or do you want me to talk about the tiers? I do. I, I love the tears. So before we go into, and this episode is actually going to be a bit of a catch up between us. We have a lot, we have a lot to discuss anyway. So we, this would have been our phone call. And we decided, look, people seem, tend to be interested in how we actually run Candle Tales as a business, as a creative form of trying to earn money in the arts, as not just a performance uh, group, but also a teaching and a workshopping kind of basis. So we're going to get to that a little later and kind of answer some questions people have asked us recently. And there's quite a lot to discuss in terms of our live shows and the amazing shows we did. And well, I thought they were amazing, but it was an amazing honor in it from Anishnok and Owen Maka. So we're going to make a moment. But first of all, I thought we'd walk you through our kind of some way cute form of Patreon support so you can Okay, so okay, take us through. You can buy us coffee. You can. Or spare you can some buy us, change is the first one, isn't it? Spare some change for coffee is the first one. So you got it. You got it half right ah, each yeah. of the I half understand. guesses you made. So <laughs> spare some change for coffee is the first one. That is two euro. Um, I think it's actually two dollars. I think they're in US dollars. Uh, okay. Second second tier is a, is a fiver. So it's five dollars. It's buy us a pint. And nice. It's a lot of pints. I mean, do you want to know how many people are buying us a pint every month, Aaron? I do actually. Yeah. How many? 
63 people are buying us a pint every month. Holy shit. Imagine if we drank all those points. <laughs> Imagine if we drank all those points. Uh, 56 people are buying us coffee every month. Um, wow. Then we've got 15 people a month buying us lunch, which is 12, $12. Buy us lunch on the go, you know, because we like a little a little rhyme. And also it's <laughs> Dublin. You wouldn't get a sit down lunch lunch for $12. <laughs> oh. uh, then we've got six people who buy who are buying us dinner every month for 25 euros. Buy us dinner, Ooh. no strings, little winky no face. No strings. Uh-huh. <laughs> love that, love that. And then we have we have one person. We have a single solitary person who is the tier that we call feckin' legend, which means she's giving us 50 euros of real money every month. Wow. That she doesn't That's... have to give us. That uh, is deadly. Which is really cool about Patreon, actually. I, I like this as a model. This is kind of like how we started this in the pub in the stag's head was do the gig and pass the hat at the end. And people gave whatever they could afford. And when we started doing the podcast online, we made a decision not to put any like episodes behind a paywall and to to kind of honor the same spirit. Because like there is bonus content. You can uh, Rue has put up some episodes about making the music. I've put up some blogs about different source books that I like. Um, we've we're pretty sporadic with Patreon content, but like we do put some good stuff up there from time to time. Um, Oshin has put up some cool unboxing videos and things from when we've gotten like new kits. So like there's there's interesting stuff up there if you're interested. Um. And also sometimes people just send us messages on Patreon, which is kind of cool. Ooh, and people get discounts if they want to do our storytelling course uh, at any stage. They get they get a Patreon discount. Um, which we will be talking about as well, because we just finished one last we night. just so finished time. one last night. It was so they, nice to do again. Weren't they great? Uh, so. And as well, I will say we got a shout out today from a woman who uh, sent us a direct donation of 50 euro, which I just think is lovely because some people don't want to be tied into a monthly thing because, you know artists and someone who worked in the arts who's not sure how much money I'll have at any one given time and don't want to be tied into contracts because I'm afraid of them um mm. yeah but you can go on PayPal and and throw us a few quid if it's something that you want to contribute and honestly guys you've no idea how humbling and how beautiful it is to get support doing the thing that we love doing from people that gain something from this as well uh it's a really uh profoundly gorgeous thing to be motivated into telling these stories the way we want to tell them the way that we see people like them to be told I guess Uh, I did not hear any of your last sentence because my internet is being a little shit Perky. Oh no. Um, so again, the guy's tech has been at us. So hope I really hope this isn't uh, an annoying one to listen to because we have a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. We do. Um, and before we, you know, get too carried away, I guess we wanted to read out a few names and get to everybody to give you a direct personal shout out. Now, right, Jerica? Yes. Absolutely. I want to say a personal heartfelt thank you in no particular order, by the way. This is the order in which Patreon gave me usernames. And we're not going to say any surnames just in case anyone has any privacy issues to Jessica, Courtney, Mandy, the all seeing guy, Dinny, Natalie, Jacob, Aoife, Avery, Laura, Chelsea, Kirk, Kira, Noah, Bill, Paul, Jennifer, Izzy, Sarah, Nasa, Murphy, Emer, Mervyn, Kirsty, Jen, Maya, Mia, Siobhan, Richard, Elizabeth, Leah, Jason, Rosemary, Janique, Brenna, Amanda. Okay, okay, well, we we can't we can't keep it. as much as I love this, right? We're gonna put a pin in this. We're gonna get to everybody, right, and give them all a heartfelt shout out. But come on, we, that was we only thirty-seven. Things. We have more than a hundred left to go. <laughs> <laughs> This is when you realize there's a lot of people. (laughs) But that's beautiful. And look, they've all been giving us a little amount and it's kept us going. It's kept us motivated and it's kept us being able to do these podcasts. But as well, turning something creative. I work as an actor. I have a voiceover artist. I'm a drama teacher. I uh, 
constantly auditioning for work. Right now, I can't audition for work because I have a busted ass in the year. I just got out of hospital on Friday for my second operation in four months. And at work, I can do voiceovers and I can write and I can sit on a stage uh, and do some live storytelling shows, luckily. But that was only on the grounds that my mom would drive me up to Dublin mm -hmm. <laughs> from Cork and, uh, you know, drive me back again. So, Honda mommy. I'm not really able to do the thing that I love doing. However, I want to reflect. I want to reflect upon the joy that we were able to take from actually performing the live shows again, because we've we went into lockdown and we went full hog at this podcast. And we've gotten a great response back and it's motivating us to do more episodes and and it more insights into how we want to do these shows and podcasts. Man, how good did it feel to be in Wheelands on the 26th of October and perform to a live audience? <laughs> that was fucking wild. And they were the giddiest audience. <laughs> like everybody was, you know, you know, that thing that it hasn't. It, I, I, I remember it, but I'd forgotten it. You know, the thing where we get on stage and we and we start chatting and, and then you make a joke and everybody laughs and you're like, ah, I like that. That was fun. I'm going to make another joke. And then I do the same thing. And the two of us just switch into fucking look at me, look at me mode. And it's fucking we could in another life. That's all we'd fucking do. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's a fine line of like, OK, actually, it, like it's it's so I and mean, I tell this to, to people all the time, like story is so different to, to acting sometimes because it completely changes in the dynamic of what the audience gives you in the room. Like, oh, yeah. the, because you don't know what, what story we're going to tell, you know? Yeah. And that audience was fizzy with excitement. It was the first time we had been on stage together and we were giddy. Just, I guess I, it was an interesting lead up as, as well to it because we were telling on Thorn the shadows of the thorn show that we had very well scripted. And I was reading through it. And I was complimenting us and our writing. And we were really bored with the idea of going into reciting a script. We were so bored of it. And it was kind of. <sighs> Listen, <laughs> this is one of the this is one of the things that has been kind of a, a, a continual tension. And, and I don't think it's a tension that we are ever going to resolve. And I don't think it's a tension we ever should resolve because I think it is in the contradiction that the that the interesting things happen. It's like it's in between the two poles that all the good stuff is because like the degree to which we are rehearsed and scripted and polished versus the degree to which we are able to be spontaneous and in the moment and like come up with new stuff is always going to be a little bit something we're swinging from one extreme to the other. But yeah, we, we had this very well scripted show. We all got like ferociously bored, chucked it out and just switched parts. And because we, you and I both knew that like we had it memorized so well that if I started trying to tell it differently, but at the same pace, I'd click back into the script and you'd do the same. So we just swapped, we just swapped sections. I think, I think we made the final decision about two days before we were due to be yeah. on stage. And it was just like, it just ended up being a lot of fun. There were probably more willy jokes than we've ever told in one show before. Well, I was happy that I managed to make you incredibly uncomfortable. That hardly talking. ever at the happens. Start of the show. That you, actually, I feel like happened. I feel like you set the tone there, and then I was like, "Well, you see, I gotta <laughs> escalate now, don't I?" Yeah. Look, 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 look at the position you put me. In. I've got to, I've got to retaliate here. I can't be taking this on the back foot. No, fuck that. Um, it's because, like, the show always starts with the pillow, pillow talk of Queen Maeve and her you know amazing sexual appetite and like whenever you and oftentimes every time you do it you get such a great response from women because you're a woman talking about a woman with great sexual appetite you get all these women yeah woo. i was like hmm, interesting will it work as a man talking about this woman in in this way and i just i made it incredibly sexy and you got <laughs> so uncomfortable with the pursing of her luscious lips licking the nape of the neck yeah, of all i don't think i've ever gotten <laughs> quite as explicit as you <laughs> but i think but yeah, i also think that's like, what i found out was like right just really get into the bed <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were you got in bed with Queen Maeve. That's what you did. <laughs> That's what you have to do. You have I to think do. I to be honest, um, I think I think it did go over moment. extremely well. 
there was a moment in the show and it was beautiful and I remembered it was like okay we've been giddy and and the, the audience is really reactive and I could see faces very few but I saw a couple and I was like right I can see a bit of teetering now of, of attention and suddenly I realized we need to bring this kind of right back to the mm. seriousness because we were going to be going into the Ferdy and the Kukulin thing and I, 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 I you know something came to me in the moment and I go okay you might be wondering how, how much longer there is and um, we're nearly there guys just hold on and suddenly like the atmosphere I think the music kind of just changed gear and then just went oh yeah and and then we were able to plunge into the darkness of the story and mm. sadness and then have that explosive roar at the end of it which mm-hmm. is always a way in their shows <laughs> yeah that was a great roar that was wonderful um but yeah no we that was wonderful we also um we have all now gotten to say that we got to play in Slane because we did a week of gigs in the uh, whiskey distillery in Slane that you and I kind of switched out on like you did some nights and I did some nights um and mm. then we had the Puka festival in Drogheda and before that you had fucking Owen Mac and Navin Fort itself yeah so like it was so we started in Whelan's and we played with uh, Sean Mulroney's kind of band and a load of mis- miscreants and amazing to have the stage shared with them that we could actually just dance after our show to Tao's music and they had a full band and then um, like you said we did those intimate shows in Slane it was really lovely to be in Slane the whiskey distillery to a small group and just chat to people mm-hmm. as you're telling stories it felt really old school really back in the days of of the you know the stag's head upstairs and like not mm-hmm. as crowded because there was it was a socially distant kind of gig and then uh, up in Omaka and it was just it was such a privilege to be at the hill you know, looking, we were looking across to where the Aumaka was, the actual, the fort itself, to see the artifacts, to be shown around the place, to be shown where the kings sat, where the druids were invited into, to have people who were steeped in that environment, who gave tours there every day, who told the stories, and to open that show with the curse of Maka, with the how the, the fort got its name from the goddess, the Morrigan, Maka, and Bob, and like, everybody was so in tune with the stories there it was beautiful and it was mm. just I think someone came up to me afterwards and and, and said you'd have been welcome in, in in the halls of the kings of old and I was just Aww. like oh. Aww. you know it was gorgeous and um to then have Sean from Tao as well and, and uh Shannon uh singing after the stories left the space for us to kind of have uh, a heart chant song before the next story and mm. yeah it was beautiful to go into those stories to people who were so receptive and so visually obviously in tune with it all like it was gorgeous nice um amazing and then the the following weekend we were kind of a little bit double booked um because well, yeah well, we, well, before that, actually, because we 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 finished our tour thing. Then we had your birthday gig, which we attempted to stream, which I don't think worked. Yeah, um, apologies. If, if apologies for that. that. We're, yeah. we're, we're hoping that we will get that to work at some point. Um, but that was not the day. Anyway, it was Aaron's birthday. And we also had our first play gig back in the Harbour Bar. Bar. Um, in in Bray, which has been a kind of home from home for a good many years now. So it was lovely to be back there and it was lovely to see people back there again. And then the following weekend was wild altogether. Um, wild altogether. Um, yeah, I mean, like, Oshin wears a lot of caps for, for Candle Tales. He was a musician and sound up and also trying to operate the live stream so apologies again i think i did live stream or second half on the phone i gave one of the girls and said hold this phone and uh, yeah. so on instagram i think it went up again the sound would be amazing or up to our standards people um but yeah. we did manage to do that and uh, hey look i was happy to celebrate my 33rd birthday on the 3rd of november in harbour bar telling stories doing what i love doing that was a lot of fun that was um, the main thing um so i'm going to read out some more names Okay. And then we're going to talk about the next, the following weekend, because that was also a lot of stuff. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to read out, <laughs> I'm going to read out some more names. And again, 
I see how many I can get in a breath because I can get quite a lot in a breath. Okay. Okay. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to Jeremy, Susanna, Jeline, Maria, Elodie, Karen, Sally, Robert, Ellie, Seamus, Liz, Maria, Alana, X, Thomas, Kyle, Liz, Jitka, Claire, Kuroi, Desiree, Carmel, Gigi, Mark, Alexandra, Marilena, Rory, Halle, Aoife, Peter, Mark, Colin, Bean, John, Kezia, Bridget, Robert, Emer, Martin and Emily. Wow. Yeah. There's actually one breath. That was actually one breath. That was impressive. <laughs> um, well done. You were kind of going blue in the face, but yeah, well done. I was getting a little pain. Very major. Anyway, now we are all, we, now we're a little over halfway through our list of patrons. See? See? Uh, Spreading uh, it out. Spreading it out. Nice. And I guess um, what, what came back to me in all of this performing, because I've been, because I've been injured, because I haven't been able to walk, perform, drive around, do what I usually do, audition and, and, and run around the place. I realized that our uh, Whelan's, with the support from Patreon, continuously kind of motivating us to go on, I would do this regardless of financial security. Like, I, I want to be able to be financially secure in this, but it is the love of connecting with people through mm. stories, through performance, and the what what we get out of sharing the passion that we get out of the stories with people who also share that passion with us in those moments is a kind of a profoundly beautiful thing that I mm-hmm. I can't quite put a measure on, and I I know now after the long break that we had, I will always want to do this. It is something that I is yeah. next to nothing. And like, I think that's the um, thing as well is like, you know, we, we have all, we'd, we'd often kind of, we had a lot of discussions about this in the very, very early days of like, you know, charging and not charging and free tickets and keeping it free and going back and forth over that for various different, in various different contexts. And like the, the reason that we, the reason that we pay ourselves and other people for live gigs is not because, um, you know, we're in it for the monetary gain, but because when you have, uh, when you are working in the arts, it is easier to mark off and cordon off time for a gig that is paid because otherwise, you know, everyone has fucking bills to pay and rent to pay. And if you, if you're not able to pay people and if we're not able to make enough to actually pay people money, we're relying on people having enough free time and enough a spare energy to put into this and that's not actually sustainable so there was a kind of there's a question of sustainability as well which I think is really important when you're doing and this is kind of I feel like I'm speaking partly to younger me here and also partly to people who are working in the arts like Mm. passion will get you so far but if you are trying to do work that pays you and feeds you and clothes you And then a separate to that work on a passion project, that's incredibly difficult because, you know, your time is finite, your energy is finite and as much of a buzz and as much of a charge and as much as as much fulfillment as you can get out of things, there comes times where it's like, well, I either go and do this job that I'm not super passionate about, but I, I then don't have to stress about my rent for the rest of the month or I go do this thing that I that I love but then I'm freaked out about rent for the rest of the month. And that's a kind of a, that's not a good place to be. So that's a place where we don't want to be, which is why we structured candle the way we did. So it's, it's again, it's one of those things where there's kind of a little bit of tension between two poles. And I feel like all the good stuff is in the middle, you know? And again, like, uh, you know, people have been asking us and have asked us recently, um, you know how do you keep candle tales going and how is it you know seven years old and you're still coming up with you know ideas and it's lovely to hear you know i know theater companies who have uh always applied for applicant for um for funding and grants and i don't have it in me i'm too scatty brain to sit down with applications and i don't have it in me to continuously look for handouts in that form in order to put on shows but i do think we've structured kind of tales in a way that we can diversify in a number of different ways in order yes. to continuously grow our knowledge 
about the source material, uh, get down to some fairly amazing insights into the culture, uh, psychology, and uh, this mythology and the craft of storytelling in itself. And so we have just finished uh, the, the arc of storytelling mm. group four last night. And it was amazing just to see a small group of people who took it on, started with us at the end of September, <clears throat> did a six week course, a bit, t- t- six week course, had a bit of a break and you know, we're sending me stories. I was listening to some of them in hospital uh, to give feedback to them. And it was, you know, it's amazing. I, every time we go back over the the beats on the, the themes, the semiotics, the stuff that like I didn't have a great grasp on, certainly when we started Candle Tales, and I've certainly learned off of you and certainly learned through teaching, has mm. been wildly successful in helping me in my storytelling. And also another kind of string to the bow of attempting to gain income for yep. a creative project, yep, yep, which yep. is kind of things. And I think, yeah, that was lovely. Um, love doing the course. And that's our, that's our fourth one now. So that's, we've got, we've done four. And as you said, the, the learning through teaching is great because it, it, it forced us to get very clear on what it was that our process actually was in order to be able to yeah. explain it to people. Um, which is cool. And people have just finished it there now. And I think Ethan Dillon was the guy who said, like, I've I've taken stuff with me that I will use for the rest of my life, you know. And we've we've had some, you know, great feedback from people, but that's that's exactly it. Like, yes, use this, go off and spread it far and wide and take what mm-hmm. we can give you. And people have been messaging us, if you're interested in doing the next course, we'll probably be doing one in January if we get the numbers. Uh, again, we'll only do these things if people actually want to do uh, mm-hmm. these with us, you know. And if you're interested, pop us an email, info at candletales.ie or send me a DM on Instagram, Facebook or Twitter and we'll get back to you. Uh, but that's just how we kind of run these. If there's enough numbers, we'll we'll put on yeah. another course. And Surika, we have a bit of a sharing to do now because you have to tell me about the workshop that you did on the 6th. Oh, oh my God. So the Brain Law Workshop. This has been something I've been looking forward to do for ages. And then I wasn't able to do it because I've busted fucking, knee. Fucking last February, man. Not February 2020 was when I um sat down and started working on these workshops because it was after a conversation with Mel from Her Story, uh, who has been a guest on this podcast. Uh, actually, I nearly forgot that we had her on. So I started talking about it. I was like, oh, yeah, she came on. Yeah, She's great. Check out that episode. That was fucking class. Um, so I, she and I had a big old chat about different workshops in that we could run as kind of like, you know, pulling on some themes from Irish mythology. And one of the ones I was most interested in getting up on its feet was this Brehan Law workshop. So this is basically, well, anyway, first off, you weren't there. <laughs> you weren't available. So I called um, Jay O'Connor, who has been kind of, well, Jay I and I have been you. friends for a couple <laughs> of years. Jay jumped in for you uh, at the, uh, when we were working on the, the project for the Civic which was game based because Jay does a huge amount of running of games and workshops and is a theater director as well. And so has a lot of experience in that. I've known them for a few years now and we play a lot of D&D together. OK, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, that's that's like that's a large part of that's a large part of our, our friendship is based around uh, D&D uh, Dungeons can and Dragons. We, momentarily segue into the message that we got recently that kind of went over my head and you I was very excited about yeah we got a message from Dale saying that they that he's involved in play testing a uh, Dungeons and Dragons um module setting that is set in ancient Ireland and in a particular uh town area that is in it uh he sent us a map which is very very cool uh if I turn on my Emails, though, it's just going to start fucking sending me notification bells. Um, there is they, they put two uh, non-player characters, two bards, brothers and sister, a brother, sister, bard pair in this little settlement called Aaron and Sarika. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, that's... You see? <laughs> that is so cute. <laughs> it's so cute. 
uh, which is just fucking <laughs> awesome. So that was a segue, but yeah, we're we're immortalizing Dungeons and Dragons now, which is very fucking cool. Uh, delighted about that. But anyway, um, <laughs> that's how you got working with Jay and how you've yes. been a very good working relationship with Jay through Dungeons yes. and Dra- Dragons, which is in fairness is a great way to see someone's voice, his performance, his skill and craft and to then bring that into the fact that we want to do workshops and have we want mm-hmm. to do workshop basic ideas with uh, within mythology yes. and specifically Brett and Law. So, yes, thank you. And having worked with Jay on Crew as well and on kind of building myth-based games last summer as well, um, when you were out, not because of your knee, but because of doing a part in a TV show, which was very cool, coming soon. Cool. Uh, so Jay and I looked at kind of figuring out how could we make a Brehan Law like court work because Brehan Law was a court system that was based on not having any police force and not having any prisons it was community enforced and it was the the punishments were fines and the fine was designed to allow the perpetrator and the victim to continue to be part of the same community And there are all of these kind of interesting little differences between Brehan law and modern law. So like in modern law, if you're fined, your your money goes to the state, goes to the government. In Brehan law, if you're fined, the money goes to the wronged party. So if if you know, which is just kind of it's, it's a lot more direct. It's a lot more like I said, it's a lot more community based and it's a lot more like um community enforced as well so what we what Mm -hmm. we did was we basically kind of took we took a bit of time at the beginning of the session we had about we had about I think we had less than 20 people there yeah we had about 13 people there so we took a bit of time at the beginning of the session and we talked about kind of concepts that were commonly understood in common law in the room because I like doing this in workshops. I like to get people to tell me what they know rather than me telling them what I know because first of all, half of the time they fucking know more than I do. And um, <laughs> I don't want to be standing there oh, telling Sandy. them something they already know. So yeah. I got that I we you know we got them to tell us what did they what were some of the principles of common law that they kind of understood what was their understanding of the common law system that we have. And it was things like that. It was things like, you know, there's a very professional legal class. Um, It's kind of the law is kind of indecipherable to people outside of that kind of class. And it can be quite class based and that, you know, theoretically, you're equal before the law. You're innocent until proven guilty. Um, Your your punishment is punitive like your your punishment is intended as a moral punishment like you've done wrong and so a bad thing has to happen to you and you're also removed from society and that has like serious consequences for reintegrating people back into society and then we kind of looked for similarities and differences between that that and Brehan law so it's stuff like in Brehan law you're not presumed innocent you're there is no presumption of innocence in Brehan law, a crime has been committed. And if you've been accused, you're accused of a crime. Uh, you're not individually responsible. Your, your family, your, your clan is responsible for your actions as well. So they bear the responsibility for you as an individual. You're not equal before the law. Um, the higher your status, the higher the punishment. Um, and this and is the thing I always focus on. And like, that's the most like, it's you're so, not equal in the law. Mm, what? Hang on a second. That doesn't sound right. And then you could go, wait a second. That's yeah. kind of genius. Of is course, it, the people it, who yeah. have more power and have uh, do an offense should actually be penalized more. And mm-hmm. the people who have less power in society and commit yep. an offense should basically be committed less. But it's it's inverse in our society, isn't it? Well, we it's, imprison people it's who effectively, are on the red line. It's it's theoretically <laughs> taken out of consideration, but actually it's inverted because the the richer you are, the better a lawyer you can afford or a barrister you can afford, the better representation you can afford to argue your case and to, to, to get your sentence reduced. So by trying to take class out of it, we actually reinforce the existing dynamic, which is interesting because when oh, we try to ignore stuff, yeah. we usually tend to continue to reinforce the thing that we're trying to ignore, don't we? Ah, um, <laughs> ignoring it doesn't work, lads. Ignoring, ignoring it doesn't work. Just does not work. No. So, 
face up all, or own up. So we did all this stuff and then we looked at some concepts around uh, kind of modern communities and community structures and how kind of postmodern communities are less based on location. They're more based on like shared interest and they're more fluid and the hierarchy is still there, but it's more flexible. Um, and we talked to people about some communities that they were involved in. Um, May I ask you to uh, repeat that for me? Anyway, I think your internet crapped out and I didn't quite get that. Let's eh. it. So just uh, apologies. I will, that's okay. I, I, it's just, this is a concept that I came back, came across back in my branding days of postmodern communities, which is basically this idea that in the modern world, you're not bound by traditional community structures, which usually are like based on where you live, like your community is based on your on your location. And most people would live in the same place for their whole lives. And most of the hierarchies there would be quite fixed and, you know, literally like, you know, literally or figuratively set in stone. Whereas in the modern world, we tend to be part of multiple communities, but at different levels of involvement. And although there's still hierarchies involved, they are much more fluid and flexible. So like you think of, say, a club, um, you might decide to be on the committee one year and you might be president the following year. And then the year after that, you might go back to like paying your dues and tipping away and coming around once a week. Um, your level of involvement is very changeable. And there are, mm. you know, you can picture it as kind of a series of concentric circles. Um, the concept is the link is more important than the thing. Um, like the the community, the, the the relationships are more important than what the relationships are built around. So like whether you're meeting people monthly to go hiking or kayaking or to volunteer or to ride motorbikes around the place, your community is going to structure itself in a similar way. Um, so we talked about that a little bit. We talked about where people were in different communities. We got them to kind of locate themselves. And then after the break, we got into the bit that Jay was really good on helping design, which was the game part of it, because we gave them a scenario where in a community, uh, an individual was accused of a crime, somebody who was close to the center of the community and whose family were close to the center of the community uh, and very kind of important in this community. And the son of this family was accused of stealing money from a woman who was much more peripheral to the community, but still involved. And we didn't get anybody to take either of those two roles. We told them what those people said, that she had made the accusation and he had confessed. And then we gave different people different roles uh, in the family, in the community and different perspectives and different information on what they knew about the situation. And then we asked three of them to take the roles of Brehens. And so the job of the Brehens was to gather information, investigate, interview people and come to a settlement that allowed the community to continue. So I, I heard uh, recently um, three questions, which kind of summarizes the Breton law, like in a very simplistic way, but I guess the first question is to ask uh, who, let me think. Yeah. Um, who's been, uh, uh, who's been hurt? Mm -hmm. uh, the second question. Uh, so identify who it is that's been hurt. Uh, second question is uh, what should be done to restore balance for, you know, uh, heal the hurt and then uh, who is it that should do that <laughs> so mm -hmm. three kind of in three simple steps those those questions is that kind of what the brands essentially ended up trying to figure out or is it the whole community still trying to figure that out we ended up in an interesting position because we ended up and I think this is the kind of thing where depending like you could run this with multiple different groups and you know we right and always of, change it'll always change an outcome somewhat but I think and like the the conclusions that people come to and then of course uh, people get real into playing their roles as well <laughs> So some people, some people were serious loyalists to this guy who had scammed this woman and were like, he would never, he's a precious, precious, innocent boy. And he's my perfect, he's my perfect child. Um, so like. Comes from a great family. How oh, he'd never do that. Absolutely it, no. 
Exactly. And then other people were like, well, he's clearly an absolute predator. So like, you know, people get really entrenched in their positions really wow. quickly of like, you know, he clearly his inter- his interest in this woman was clearly kind of, you know, um, he was clearly motivated by wanting to to get one up on her. And and all this, there was all people bring so much kind of stuff to it. There's really, really interesting. So they came to a resolution. Uh, some okay. negotiation had to happen out loud. And it was actually really interesting how much of the process in order for it to get to a point where everyone did actually agree, because they, they did, they got to a point where they where they agreed with the judgment and kind of all said that they were happy or happy enough with it, going right. to live with it. But it actually took quite a lot of, you know, what is what is the judgment? Of the, what do the Bretons suggest? And then the family would object. And then if the family objected, I would kind of go to the community and say, well, do you agree with their objection? And the community would say, no, we think the family are being unfair. So it would go back to the Brehens to be like, OK, well, what what now? And so there, there was this kind of there was this really interesting kind of like back and forth sort of three way dialogue that we were facilitating. Hmm. That was very kind of public forum and like, you know, they got to at one point they got to a, a almost a settlement and then one of the community members was like if they pay if they only pay that i'm leaving <laughs> oh yeah, yeah <laughs> which was really yeah, interesting because yeah. it was like oh well if if she leaves who else is going to leave you know is right. that going to be the beginning of a landslide in your community because family remember that you this community is important to you 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 need them yeah, um yeah, yeah. so like it just it became it, it was really, really interesting because it was kind of and this was one of the things that I had discussed with Jay a good bit before before it and after it was like the difference for us as people who have grown up in an individualistic society um, and kind of saying like, well, personal responsibility versus the responsibility of a clan or the responsibility of a family or a wider group. So anyway, it was great. It was really interesting. I have, it's the first time I've gotten to run any of those workshops that were designed for her story. There are a rake of them up on the website. Um, if anybody great. would like to do any of those. <laughs> and it was, but it was funded by uh, Wicklow County Council. It was, um, it was Wicklow's, uh, Wicklow's Wonder Women, uh, a centenary celebration of uh, two important Wicklow women who were trailblazers in the uh, legal field and the sea captaining field. So they had some really cool events going on uh, over that whole week. Brilliant. And I'm delighted. Um, and yeah, I mean, that was the reason that you couldn't come to Ishnuk. And on the 7th, which was what I wanted to fill you in very briefly, yes. uh, was the performance we did in uh, at the Hill of Ishnuk. And I got a call from Francis asking us to perform there for a true sound. Now I'd look up what the book true sound was, lads. Um, but it's according to, to the lunar calendar and watching the stars, obviously our ancestors didn't have calendars. And so they they congregate at certain times of year. And obviously they'd be much more in tune with the landscape. They'd be watching the leaves of the trees and they'd be looking for the new moon. And this was when they, they'd kind of gather towards um, the hill of Ishnuk, the center point of, of, of Ireland. And it was, you know, it was a dark field. There was a tractor came in to put a floodlight on the field so they could arrange all the seats. And we came in there at three o'clock and there was just seats being spread out all over fire pits. Uh, the the landowner, the farmer, um, uh, Danny, uh, was fantastic to, to actually allow it all happening and, and very thrilled that there was a little stage built on stones right next to the visitor center. And we were the first to perform on that stage. Now, someone else had performed in front of it, but we were the first to perform at that stage by the visitor centers on the Hill of Ishnik. Not on specifically the hill, but um, unfortunately, I wasn't there to like go gallivanting around to the Bridget's Well and up onto the hill and no. looking at all. I wasn't. I wasn't able to because of a busted knee. But at the same time, it's choosing the stories for the specific area and the specific time. What stories do you tell? So because Ireland gets its name from Eru, I told kind of a summary of the book invasions and the landing of the Milesians with Bamba, Fola, Eru and meeting the Sons of Mill on the Hill of Ishnak to, to name the island Ireland. So that was kind of our opening story. Nice. Um, we 
had Sean Mulroley and um, Rory, uh, who plays with Tao as well, playing songs in between the stories as mm-hmm. well, which is lovely. Gave me a bit of time off and mm-hmm. chat to keep my drum and go on. Uh, I then followed it with a story about Bridget and uh, I guess everyone knows a little bit about Bridget and there's Bridget's well near the the area and near the hill. And I kind of, you know, all that into the, you know, the, the light side and the dark side of Bridget yeah. and the fact that she is a triple goddess. And then I told a story of her potential conception between the dog there and the <laughs> Morrigan, which I absolutely love. <laughs> I went on a treat. Yes, we've we've had some pushback on that on the podcast because some people have insisted that she's uh, the daughter of the Dagda and Boan, which is like, I I see it. I get it. Uh, poetry okay. goddess. I think she's a little bit. I've, I I feel like Bridges. I, I keep coming back to the Morrigan because I think Bridges just got a lot of she's got a lot of uh, she's got a lot of edge to her. You know she's what I mean? She's got an edge. <laughs> in, in those stories, especially the salt story, of, uh, the man saying, no, I won't give you any salt when he's carrying a big bag of salt. And she says, oh, no, these are rocks. These are rocks. And he goes, OK, let, let the rock go. And then uh, they all and turn into rocks, crush him. Crushed to death. So I would also like to thank Alexandra, Laura, Nula, James, Kira, Colleen, Anne, Kerry, Kerry Lee, Kelly, Patrick, Nikki, Elizabeth, Maria, S.R., Rebecca, Linz, Megan, Louise, Matthew, Bethany, Richard, Anna, Lauren, Gronya, Lorian, Owen, Fiona, Samantha, Maria, Antoinette, Georgia, Gordon, Claire, Kiara, Andrew, Darren and Jay. <laughs> well done. And uh, that was our halftime break. And obviously we have more songs. I came back and I've been wanting, I didn't know when and how and I need to do it for the podcast, but to tell the Dean Keck story and the land with Aramid and the reason why you got to go out and, you know, collect the herbs from the land because Aramid oh, yeah. and Mia are, are uh, Dean Keck, the famous healer of the two of the Danon. And uh, I was praying to Aramid uh, with this knee operation recently. And I was mm-hmm. calling in the power of Dean Keck when I was drinking the bone broth to try and get my knee healed. And, you know, and like I kind of feel more in tune with the landscape when I'm actually telling the stories, but I don't always like gain that access into the kind of mythological um, background and, and pagan belief, I suppose, that, that also surrounds these stories. And then to finish it off, Sarika, I told the story of Lou feeling Balor of the Evil Eye and how the people who gathered year after year after Lou and the two of the Danon would congregate and they would roar. <laughs> and we got an amazing roar from everybody as they all sh- for God knows what I can't remember but there's a Amazing. clip of me absolutely on one saying that they shouted for whatever it was for health for love for longing for loss for all the things you've lost and loved and they let that roar um, yeah and something like that nice and, nice um, big cathartic bellow on a hill I, Asked everybody to be the hero of their own journeys and because, you know, to, to step into the light of Lou because no one else is going to do it for you and to spread the inspiration around as much as you can because, again, no one else is going to do it for you but you have to find that source of light somewhere else. Um, Amazing. Where did you end? Did you end? Uh, I ended at J, so your next two were... <laughs> Liam Thank and Lucy. Thank you so much to Liam, Lucy, Anne, Susan, Elizabeth, Ryan, Tara, Catherine, Deirdre, Neve, Kaylee, D, Cole, Connell, Lauren, Grant, Louise, Claire, Sweeney, Claire, Coney, Anna, Kiva, Anne, Russell, April, Emmett, and Selena. Yeah. Also, apologies to all the, pa- the Patreon patrons whose names either of us mispronounced because I know I mispronounced many of them. Uh, but we appreciate you massively and uh, thank you so much for helping support us and if there are anyone of you out there who feel like ah, a bit of spare change wouldn't go amiss we will be buying Oshin a new laptop to do all these podcasts because that's what we do spare change so in the you know rattling the hats before Christmas and all of the spending that's going to come our way that's what we do we always pay performers we always pay our collaborators we always try and help spread these stories as far away as we can with the money that you give us it's what we do with it and then um, we are so thankful for all your help we look forward to telling life stories again and we'll have to look forward to next week for a podcast story. All right. Uh, All right. We will see you then. Thank you so much. <laughs> Grow me. Grow more me. <laughs> <laughs> you.